Guys, do you want to learn how to build a killer sales team from the world's number one online business coach as voted for by Forbes magazine? Well, I do, and that is what we're going to be doing today. Welcome to the Matt Haycock Show. I'm here today with a special guest and a very good friend of mine, Lauren Tickner. She is the owner of Impact School. She's an online coach. She's been described by the London Stock Exchange as a genius marketeer or a marketing genius one or the other. Um, and it's great to have her here. When we spoke this morning about what we we're going to record today, and she said, do you want to talk about building a killer sales team? I thought 100%, because even if no one watches this, I want to learn how to build a killer sales team, because any of you guys that follow me will know that I always moan about how I've been hiring salesmen for 20 years who cannot sell. I mean, literally, I, I tell you what, Lauren, I say that with no exaggeration. There is not one pet member of my sales team over the last 20 years that I would like to have back. I was, I was trying to think of a polite word to say, but honestly, there's not, there's, there's not one person who has ever been able to s sell enough to cover their wages. Oof. Literally, whether I've, I've hired people from every end of the spectrum, because I've thought, maybe it's me, maybe it's my hiring choices. So I've had 20 grand people, you know, fresh out of school who we pay super high commissions to. Um, I've had 80, 90 grand people who have got, you know, great experience and CVs and everyone in between. And honestly, I just find them all so, so lazy and so, so disinterested and just, you know, they sit back, no matter how high or low the salaries, you all sit back on the salary. So clearly it's got to be me doing something wrong. <laughs> I think and thanks for being here. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I mean, I would say that's the first problem, right? The salary. All of our guys are just on commission, straight commission only. It keeps them super hungry. And so we have them ascend through the ranks. So they'll start out as a setter, so an SDR, right? So sales development rep. And so that's where the aim is. They're going out there, they're finding their own leads. And the aim is for them to get those leads booked onto a sales call with a closer. And we say that a closer isn't actually a closer unless they're bringing in 100K a month. 100K so, of revenue. Yeah, of revenue. Right. Let me backtrack on a couple of bits there, then, because because I've got some questions that I'll put this into relevant context. You know, for my business, which I'm sure then other other people can can do the same with theirs. You, where where are you recruiting from, and how are you recruiting? Because I do completely agree with the concept that um, you know, if people if people have to sell before they can earn anything, then uh, it's, it's going to make them a lot a lot more hungry. But I've always found it very difficult to recruit people who are, pre who are prepared to work for no salary whatsoever. Because now, I don't know whether it's a British thing, but you know, th th yeah. there's, always, there's always this expectation that even if, I mean, even for someone who is happy to be, let's say, heavily, heavily commission orientated, they still need whatever, 15, 20 grand a year. They, they need something just to know that the mortgage is paid and there's, there's at least some beans on toast on the table. I mean, I've never been, I'm trying to think. There was one time I created a structure whereby it was all, it wasn't revenue led, but it was activity led. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, I, but like getting sales calls booked on a calendar or something or leads. Oh, but it was based on number of outbound calls, right. num number of appointments booked. Uh -huh. and the, because I because I tried to back work what I do. And I said, well, listen, if I sell X amount and I sell X amount by doing by doing this. So for example, you know, we I need to make a thousand, a hundred calls a day. And you know, from those hundred calls a day, I'll book two appointments. And from those two appointments, I'll make one sales. Right. All, all of the activities. The funnel math. Yes. Yeah. All, all of the activities were kind of built into math. So it was like, for example, I think what we did was you said, as long as you make 100 calls a day, mm -hmm. you get £60 a day mm -hmm. or, 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 or whatever the figure was. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that, you know, as long as they've made those 100 calls, then the, the math is going to say that the 100 calls will turn into two appointments or, and, and, and this will turn into that. So unless they're making those calls very badly, which is obviously then down to, down to us to, to listen in and, and change that, the math should lead out. And it was kind of a compromise between not giving them a salary but giving them a salary as, as, as long as you made that. But wh where do your salespeople come from and how do you recruit them? Yeah, so it's kind of shifted over the last 12 to 18 months. So at first it was all around the world and I typically would find that my sharpest people were either in Australia or the USA. But then last year we opened up an office in London. And so now we have people actually going into the office every day. The ones that aren't there, we have monitors on the screen so that they can call in so that what they can also be in the office for like the daily stand up meetings and such. 
And so now we have a team of eight who are actually in London. So, so eight people physically in London. Physically in London. With no salary. They are getting a small base so that they can be on the PAYE. But that's only been since that we opened the office, right? The others who are in the America, um, Colombia, uh, Australia, they have straight up just their commission. And the way that we did it is that even if they are starting out, they're still going to make kind of, as you were saying, like it's kind of like a commission based upon the number of sales calls that they're getting booked. Because to be honest, if they can't book enough sales calls to be making still a decent salary around like $4,000, $5,000 a month, which for someone who's in SDR, that's a that's still a good salary because that that's like the bottom level, then they're just not hitting KPIs, right? Like they are way below KPIs. So we make it decently simple for them to like ascend through the ranks because in sales, because you are constantly just doing a very similar thing again and again and again and again. You know what it's like, right? It's exhausting and really, really draining just hearing no and no and no. So we like to kind of create mini wins for them. So for every certain number, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but let's just say for every 100 sales calls you get booked, then we'll bump up their commission by like one pound 50 okay. every single time that they now get a new sales call booked. And then we'll increase it again for the next 50. And then when they go through four of those phases, then they get to qualify to actually become a sales closer, right? And so then the sales closes again, the way that we break down their commission will also depend upon the volume of revenue that they're bringing in for that month. And so the more that they bring in, okay, so the more like that a, they a get. Tiered thing. Tiered and sliding scale. And then also the closers, like the beautiful thing about it is once they become a closer, like in order to be an actual closer, 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 we say to them like, you're not a closer until you hit 100K revenue per month. And then in order to maintain that title, they just want to do it from prestige, right? Because they just like to know for themselves, like, yeah, I'm a closer. And, and you've got the two, you've got closers and what do you call the other people? We call them setters, right? If we just keep it but super you just have simple. The two. You've got setters and you've got closers. There are also people who basically just do prospecting. So for us, it's kind of a little more complicated, right? Because we have a lot of organic traffic coming in. Like at one point when I was on Clubhouse last year, we're getting like 400 or 500 DMs a day on Instagram. But like our funnel was running whereby we'd have a DM come in, then we have a bot and you know the bot, right? And, I know the bot. <laughs> and then on the back end of the bot, then that email gets zapped over into our CRM where they're going to get emails and such. But then at the same time, if they don't, from the bot, they don't take any action, the sales team will then manually follow up with these people, okay. right? And so the people there, they're basically our best setters because we want our best setters speaking to people on behalf of myself. Whereas if we're using our Facebook group, for example, and we're prospecting, then we have people, these are actually based in London in the office. There's a couple of them there who will go out and do outreach onto people to then go out and set the calls and to aim to essentially bring in leads for the setters. So they're more like, business development BDRs rather than SDRs, right? So that's kind of the distinction. So let's just go back to the actual recruitment of, of these, mm. you know, of, of these setters. Mm -hmm. um, and presumably are closers internally created for you as, in, as every closer closer has been a setter? Yes, okay, always. So you've, always. you've never brought in a closer from, from the outside? Only my sales manager, but that was a very strategic decision because okay. we ended up doing a deal whereby we partnered in creating the office as well. And so he then runs that sales floor. And so he's ran hundreds and hundreds of people in London in the, in, in the city, right? Running stockbroking exchanges and trading trading floors. And so that's where I knew that he would have the ability. And, and it's pretty cool how he treats the sales floor as well, because like we do some done for you sales for clients. It's not really something that we're trying to scale, but like he basically told me this one thing and it always stuck with me that every single client or impact school itself is essentially like a different commodity, right? And so why, I, why do you, Lauren, get so emotional about impact school when you just think about it like a commodity? You're only emotional about it because it's your business. And then he's like, sales is sales. And so it's been really eye-opening for me kind of having someone come in who's much more detached from the company and then treating the sales process like how you would sell any 
asset related like if you're selling like a property or something like that because for me it's coaching as well and it's a very like emotional empathetic type of business and industry and when you're the business owner like you get way too emotional like I'll be in the past I've been on sales calls and I'll give people way too big of a discount or I'll be like oh no don't worry like we can we can do this payment plan and spread it over 12 months even if it's like a three-month program just because I'm like it's okay like whatever and then yeah, so having him come in with sort of that more um, sharp mindset has been great. But back to your point, like regarding where do we hire them from? Yeah, I was, so I was going to say, where do you where do you hire them from? What what are you looking for? For as in, I don't know, what does a job description look like? And uh, you know, I know we're not allowed to talk about it in today's world, but there's no rules here. Um, you know, are they male, female? You know, how old are they? You know, I mean, I mean, I'm sure you don't exclude male, but but what what does the, the ideal person you know tend to look like? It doesn't really matter. Like, that's not the important thing. So we find them, we use indeed.com. Indeed.com has been by far the best for us. And I read this book, I think it was called Spin Selling or something, whereby they had an advert on how to find a great salesperson. And the title literally says, we are looking, we, we kind of tweaked it ourselves, but it's like, are you a superstar sales salesman? It said, so we changed it to salesperson. And then basically it's saying like, we are looking for someone who's hungry, who will work on commission only, who's ready to hustle for deals, who wants to make at least 10 grand a month. And you're gonna be most likely working 12 to 14 hours a day. So we make it like hell. <laughs> so that then if they're actually opting into that, we know that it's gonna be someone who's hungry and who actually wants it. It's interesting what you say on that about, you know, we want someone who wants to make at least 10 grand a month. Mm. And and I think that that's so important when it ties in with, it ties in with the salary thing as well. Because when I've had, you know, uh, dismissals, disciplinaries, arguments with some of my historical sales guys, and I've sat down to try and work through the numbers with them and say, listen, if you're not selling X, then that that means I I need you to sell X for me to earn Y. Exactly. And if I'm if I'm earning Y, then that means you're earning Z. But the problem here is you don't seem to want to earn Z. You're happy to fucking earn X, mm -hmm. and because you're earning X, that means I'm only earning this. And believe me, I'm not I'm not happy earning that off you. And until until you can actually want to earn some more money, nothing's ever going to change it. Complacency is the biggest killer of salespeople, and so. We want our guys to be making as much money as possible. I mean, God, I want them all driving the best car, living in the best house. Like they are like the closers of the aspirational role. And so here's the thing. When you set them up to win, that's how they can actually see themselves living that lifestyle. And so a, a great example is like me my situation is very aspirational to my sales team. Like living here in Dubai, like they see, you know, all of the nice, I mean, I say all the nice things that I do. I kind of work a lot, but you know, <laughs> but, but like all the nice the places lotus that I go. Cakes. Oh yes, all the lotus cheesecakes that we eat on the beach. I mean, seriously though, but they see the life in Dubai and then that is so aspirational to them that they want to hustle to be able to get that. And so they're going to keep working and working and working because they want that life of freedom. So. It really comes down to for every business that for our clients as well, we see that it's different. So for some of our clients, for example, I have this one client, Raj, he owns this company called GovShop, which is massive government contracting business. And so his sales guys don't aspire for the same thing. They just want to have really, really big houses like he has and be able to take the kids on the best holidays like he does. And so it's a different type of aspiration. And so I think then that also comes down to the type of person that you're gonna find. So like his sales team, he had to make some very strategic decisions to get rid of some of the young kids on his team because they weren't the right fit for his business. They were wanting to rip around in Lambos and cars like that, but it wasn't a good fit for where he's taking his company. So I think values. Why, why was that a problem for him? Because I, I was gonna say, does it matter what they aspire to as long as that aspiring means that they're gonna earn some money? It, co it comes down to miss selling, right? Okay. And so one of the problems is that if someone just cares about money, this is the fi this is the fine balance, right? Because for example, with his business, like I know that they can sell some really big deals because their deals go up into like the multiple millions, right? And so if you miss sell something like that, obviously the bigger the deal, the more sizable the commission is gonna be for the sales rep. However, I mean, we've even had it in the past, right? Where like we would have accidentally sold like a lower level program because our commission wasn't done properly, our sales team was selling a lower level program because they'd rather just take an easy sale 
and then sell something because they know that they'd get the commission coming through rather than try and push for the right program that would have been the right fit, but a little bit of a stretch when they know that they might not get the commission. So let's say there's a course that's like $2,000 versus a course that's 15. If they know that they can be guaranteed 200 bucks here, versus maybe not getting the 1.5K here, if they're getting complacent, yeah, as you said, like they're just gonna take the 200 each time. And then that causes a problem for the rest of the, the business because not only are you not gonna be hitting your targets, but as well as that, the coaches are gonna be in a, like for me, at, at least in a coaching business, the coaches are gonna be in a really bad position because they're gonna be coaching someone super high level who's only paid barely a little bit of money. And so they're not the best coaches, the better coaches are in the higher level program and they have the experience to help the person that needs the high level mm -hmm. type of stuff, right? So um, just back to the question though, finding the right type of people. I mean, I think nowadays, like the really cool thing is that so many people want to work online. And so I don't think you need to have an office. We like to have an office, especially because the guy that manages my sales team, he's used to being in the city, like managing a team physically in person. He likes that. That's the way that he does things and it works for us. But for the longest time, we were always running things like fully virtually, fully remote, but having proper training is the most important thing. I mean, I was gonna say, how do you train and manage these people? Because- Daily training. D daily training individually or, or, or as a group? Because I mean, and, and also, I mean, do you have some kind of system to listen to the calls and see what they do so you can spot check? Because, you know, I don't know, you, you, you take someone on in Australia and you, and you never see them. I mean, how, how do you know that they are, you know, behaving themselves, representing your brand? like not mis-selling. Yeah, it's, there's, there's, there's different phases to it, right? So the first phase is in the phase of setting calls. So actually being someone that's doing appointment setting. So for some people, obviously, if you only have inbound leads, then great, like you don't really need to worry about this. But ultimately, if you're going through a process where you're doing the messaging, as in texting to get a sales call booked, then it, all, it really comes down to having a checklist to make sure that you can tick off all the boxes before inviting someone on a sales call. So we call this the money-making messaging method, right? There's multiple different phases. So the first phase, and it doesn't matter what order it happens in, but the first phase might be knowing the outcome that this person wants to hit. Okay, so what are they trying to do? So for us, maybe their outcome is that they wanna have a 50 grand a month online coaching program. Okay, cool. So that's an outcome we now know that an outcome that they want is something that we can help with. Perfect. Second out, second uh, tick checkbox is like, okay, let's figure out, are they a decision maker? Okay, so do you have a business partner? Or is this a type of thing that you would consult with your spouse on, depending what you're helping with? Just casually putting it in the conversation, right? Again, ticking that off the box. Now, sometimes I see people trying to do this like in a script or through a bot flow, and it does not work because it has to be a really natural human conversation. And so that's why it doesn't have to happen in any specific order. So I would really ask yourself, like when it comes to this process prior to a sales call, what are the things that you need to get out of someone to have a successful meeting? Because so many people, they just like, oh yeah, what's your number? I'll give you a call. And then they get on the call and then they're like, oh, well, I don't know. I thought you were just going to give me some free advice. Whereas if you know all of the, the, specific, the specifics that could actually set you up to win on that call, then you're going to be able to come there more prepared. So half of that can be done through a conversation. It could even, it could be a quick five minute call where you ask them these quick questions, but then some of it can also be done through like an application form, right? It's just figuring out what works best for you. So for us, as an example, we won't ask really important things that we need to know, such as what is your current revenue? We won't ask that in the chat. We'll put that on an application form because people find it a little uncomfortable to type that. They'd rather just pop it in a little form, right? And so how we're reviewing this stuff is what, what I do for the first two weeks, and now my sales manager does this, the first two weeks that they're working, they're sending us two hours of looms of them messaging. <laughs> they're literally sending it in, submitting it, then we'll review it, and then we'll, like I, when I was doing this like a year and a half ago myself, they would record the whole loom, I'd watch it back on two times speed while recording my screen, and I would then pause when they did something wrong. Even if they wrote there instead of there, you know, like, and they got their grammar wrong, I would tell them, install Grammarly. And simple things like that. Or if they would say something that's too direct or they didn't acknowledge what was said in the conversation before, I would say, okay, you need to say at least ha ha. Something like that, it makes such a difference because otherwise it sounds so robotic. And, and how, how many um, leads a day would these people be expected to deal with? Oof. So back then, I mean, 
I did not have specific KPIs for number of people to talk to per day, but our aim for all of our salespeople is book 10 sales calls a day, minimum. Okay. That's what we need the, the SDRs doing. And so we know that per, so for every, for every one SDR, so setter, we know that they can fill the calendar of two closer. Okay. Right, because if they're because the closers will have let's say each five calls, but then they also have their follow up calls and everything as well. So then it ends up being a full schedule for them because always the closers are always taking follow up calls with people from the past too, and so that kind of tends to work out pretty nice. But yeah, tens the minimum. Usually, like our guys are aiming for fifteen to twenty. And and are all the leads that they call from are they are they all inbound from something or or or, or do they do any kind of cold outreach? So we do call for outreach as well. So our aim every day is 150 outreach. So what we're doing right now is around- Per, per person? Overall, okay. overall. We have so much inbound that we don't need to do as much outbound. However, I'm trying to get them to crank up the gears, obviously. So this so is 150 outbound leads. 80 on LinkedIn. We slowed it down on LinkedIn recently. Again, it's going to be different for everyone, but for me and my business, we just haven't found the leads to be as effective on LinkedIn. We found that our better leads are on Facebook and Instagram. And so what they'll do is they'll do, yeah, they'll do 80 on LinkedIn. We are tapering that down and we're increasing on Instagram. And then we're doing, how many is it on Instagram? Basically, the rest is split between Facebook and Instagram. I don't know the exact split right now because I'm not managing that myself at the moment. But um, I know that the number is 150 a day and I get a checkbox that has been done every day. So I know it's being done and I see the results as well. I mean, it's actually insane because on Instagram, you can do something as simple as just replying to someone's story, literally just replying to their story in a super casual way. And if you have credibility and authority on your page, then you'll get the response. So you obviously have the blue tick on your page, so it's easier for you. When you don't have that, one of the things, like I have this one client who's a trauma recovery coach. And so what he does is he will find people who are following influencers who talk about overcoming trauma. And so then he'll go through who's commenting on their most recent posts. Um, and we gave him a script, which basically says, hi, I saw your comment on XYZ's post. XYZ, XYZ's post. Um, it was really eye-opening to see you be so vulnerable when it comes to your healing journey. Always looking, I think the script went something along the lines like, I've been a trauma recovery coach for the last couple of years, so if you ever need anything, I'm here to lend a hand. And then he'll go onto their profile, like their few most recent posts, comment on the most recent one saying, like acknowledging it and saying, by the way, I sent you a DM, check your message requests. And honestly, it sounds like this wouldn't work, but it's really bloody effective. Tell me though, so when people are outreaching as you, sorry, uh, I've answered my question. When my question. clients are outreaching. No, when your staff are doing outreach on Instagram, yeah. are they outreaching as you? Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, these use your Insta account or something, do yeah. they? Yeah, um, And But for me, it's easier. And for you, it would be easier, right? So when you have built your personal brand, like you can't, so what we, and this is, this is actually funny because a few years ago, I was trying to help some of my clients with this and they just weren't getting a result. And I was literally like, what the hell? I, I don't understand why they can't get the result. Because for me, I can just reply with a laughing face to people's stories and then they will reply back to me. And they'll be like, oh my gosh. Like, And so you can't take that lightly when you've, and that sounds so cringy saying it out loud now I realize, but it's, it's true because when you spent years building a brand, people in the space will know who you are. Whereas, if you're brand new and just getting started, you have to be a little more forward and make it clear as to what it is that you're doing when you're doing the outreach. And so this is where really just being super low pressure, really non-spammy. I mean, how many times a day do you get those DMs like, do you want to grow your Instagram? I was, I was just about to ask you, ask you the same thing. I mean, I, mean we're, we're, I guess we're talking the same theory as what those guys do, aren't they? But, 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 they, but the content is just so wrong. So, so different. Wrong. But also... Um, I don't know, see, the way that I see it is that the outreach that you're doing when you're trying to actually build a relationship with someone is just casual. It's like, no stress if you don't reply, like, either way, I'm cool. That's more how I see it, whereas theirs is like fully sales, whereas this is more like service, and it feels like service as well, rather than feeling like sales. And I think that's a beautiful way of doing sales, when it feels like customer service. That's probably, I would say, the most important thing when it comes to being in, at least in the coaching online courses space, that 
I come from. In property and in different areas like that, I think you can be a little bit more to the point because people are looking for deals. But then again, that's deals versus actually client and coach or client and business relationship. So interesting, interesting. So I've, I've, I've got, uh, I've got, like, I've not gone quiet. I've got like twenty things going going on in my head all at once. Here, um, I, 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 it's about the first time I've not had my notepad down for uh, <laughs> taking notes for what I want to do myself. Um, I mean, wh when do you decide that some someone's not making the grade if they aren't hitting KPIs? But how, how long do you give them? We give them three strikes. Okay. Three months, effectively. No strikes. Three strikes. But That's it. There's high churn in sales teams. So they this is like the daily KPIs or... or I mean, we do, okay, weekly. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so like, look, if someone on Monday doesn't hit their KPIs and, okay, Tuesday, they don't hit their KPIs. Wednesday, okay, we're going to say something to them. And then if on Thursday they don't turn it around, we'll say something to them again. And we'll probably give them a warning then. And then on Friday, we'll look at their numbers for the week. And if it's really low, we'll have a talk with them. But rather than just giving a warning, like we also give them extra training. I see, I think this is the thing. If they're on their level one of being an appointment setter, so the SDR, if they're literally lowest of the low, then okay. If they're week one and they are really bad, like we're not gonna bother training them honestly, because it's just, it's not worth it. And this is the nice thing about starting someone at least on commission only, because you haven't got them on PAYE yeah. and all this stuff. It's just, it's an easy, okay, sorry, it didn't work out. No stress either way, right? Now, in the past, I had a very, very, very high churn because I did this one thing, which I realized wasn't good. And I thought it was good because it meant that I could see who was the winner and who wasn't. But what I was doing is I was getting 20 new guys to start all at once. And when I say guys, guys and girls. Mm -hmm. So I would have 20 people start in one hit. <laughs> and can you imagine? These could be all over the world. All over the world. I was doing daily huddles with them. And then I was reviewing all of their messaging two hours a day. I was watching it in like 3.5 times speed and I was just kind of checking just to kind of see if, and it was crazy. But I tell you, I did get four really good people out of that who are still with me now. Like these are really sharp people. Two of them right now are closers. And then one of them is our lead uh, specialist or our lead setter. And then the other one is still a setter. But they, this one also tr like kind of supports and helps the others. And so that was the good side of it. But I wouldn't do that again because I think it creates this risk whereby if, and I've done it honestly a couple of times and I should have learned the first time not to do it again. But if one person starts screwing up or starts kind of being a bit of a cultural mismatch, then what ends up happening is that then feeds into everyone else. And so if one person kind of starts complaining a bit, then the others start to think that it's okay to do the same thing. And they're so new to the business, they don't have respect. So I wouldn't do that again. Now what we do is we'll strategically bring on one or two people at the same time and then train them up properly and get them fully started. But now we obviously have the whole full onboarding and the whole entire you know specific way that we enroll new people. So how do we do that? So we'll find them on indeed.com. And so this is someone who has raised their hand and made it clear like, yes, I am a superstar salesperson. I want to get started. So then what we'll do is we'll give them a trial task and we'll say, okay, this is our pitch deck. This is our business. Go and find us five leads. <laughs> and then we get them to go and set five calls for our setters. They use their own profiles. They can go about doing it as they like. We give them our money-making messaging method so that they can go out there and get it. And then we give them three days to go and get five sales calls booked. They get those five sales calls booked, then one of our closers will take those five sales calls to see how these leads were. And so if at least one of those leads was good and could have potentially been a client, then we'll bring them into the next phase, which is whereby they can just get started. But they get started under supervision. So they'll get on a call with our lead specialist and the, our lead specialist will let them share their screen and they'll be logged in to, for example, my social media, so my Facebook and Instagram inbox, and they'll start messaging following our money-making messaging method again. And so then our lead specialist will then be reviewing the way that they're messaging, seeing, are they following the checklist? Are they following the process? Is it coming natural to them? Are they having an authentic conversation? And if they like it after that initial call, cool, they do it again the next day, another hour. And then honestly, after one or two times, if it feels good, then what we then do is we allow that new hire to then start doing the messaging while recording their screen 
on Loom. They record it an hour. What's they then Loom, submit a screen it. recorder? Yeah, it's just a screen, a screen recording thing. But basically, it's a Chrome extension. And so you record. And then when it's done recording, it just copies to your clipboard like a link. So then you can just easily send links back and forth rather than massive MP4 files. Just makes it quicker and easier. And so, yeah, they'll submit their screen recording. That will then get reviewed. Um, and then, honestly, usually we then, then just say after that first week, okay, cool, Monday, let's get it. And then they just start. And so then from there, then what we look for really in that first week of them properly starting is getting five sales calls booked today. If they're not getting five, I mean, in that first week, there is no way it's working. Then after that, then obviously we just, we look for 10 and 10's the, 10 the goal. And so then as they begin to get more and more booked, then they start getting more paid more and more per sales call that they set that then t closes into a deal. And that's how we then end up paying them. And then they be then become a closer and, and they're the ones doing the sales calls effectively. They won't necessarily become a closer for sure like I have this one girl on my team who is amazing Her I'm sorry they don't necessarily but that the next step up from then is they can become a closer they can basically opt in or opt out pretty much so if they get to the point where they could be a closer then they get to go through the process of the interview process the role play calls and see if they could actually do it I mean some of our people are just so good at the setting process that it doesn't make sense change. yeah and so well not even that but it's like it's kind of like in business <laughs> in business there are some people who are really good producers they're so good at copywriting they're so good at building funnels they're so good at being a coach then when it comes to the next step in their career naturally they're going to become a manager right and so they step into the manager role and they crumble yeah they're terrible at managing people they suck with deadlines and accountability and they they just don't enjoy it and so it's the exact same thing with appointment setters and then closers on the sales team so we have some who are so sharp, they're maybe a bit more introverted. They love just messaging or sending out emails and getting calls booked like that. But then when it comes to being on the phone all day, they cannot think of anything worse. Even if they could make double, triple, quadruple the amount of money, they're fine here because they want that life of enjoyment and, and purpose, you know? And so that's kind of the analogy that I like to use. And so, yeah, with regards to then the closers, um, to your point, how do you get them to be good? So just going back to what I was saying earlier, daily training, daily stand up, they'll have the first thing that's done on that daily call. And it's kind of a meeting, really in-person meeting with people calling in on the screens is client testimonials. What is this company here for? What are our values? What is our mission? Who are we helping? And then we'll read out one or two new testimonials a day. I only go to one of these meetings a week. I don't go every single day, but every single day follows the same cadence because another thing that's important for salespeople is just that familiarity, right? Getting them in that primed mindset. And so testimonials are read out and then they go through straight into a couple of objections that they've had and how to role play them out. And so they'll all be role playing together is it's kind of a nice environment because the guys who come up with like really good ob objection handling uh, scenarios and, and ways of overcoming the objection, they're all like, oh, yeah, but this could be better or that could be better or this would be better. And so they're all trying to like one up one another because it's just a competitive env environment. And that's an environment that has like it can't just be a normal call where you're just like, OK, and so today we're going to hit. 25 new deals or five new it's, it's not boring like that it has to be fun and a lot of energy and one of the best things that i also learned from my sales manager they start the day at 10 in the morning uk time they don't start at like seven because we want to get them to go to the gym in the morning we want them to get their body moving we want to get them doing their you know daily affirmations or whatever they want to be doing so that they can get the blood flowing and get in that zone and so then they come into work and they are ready to go, they're energized, they're pumped. Do you pumped. start all your team at, at later or, or just the sales guys? The sales guys who are in the office, right? And so they come in at that time and they start that little bit later. But yeah, everyone else, honestly, for my whole team, it's decently flexible. I mean, I don't have specific hours that they need to work. And uh, it's because two of my core values are freedom and fulfillment, you know? And so I want to be able to allow my team to live by that too. And so obviously there's customer service whereby we have a 24 seven schedule. So obviously that's a little bit different because they're on shifts, but yeah, for everyone else who's on salary rather than kind of like shift hour times, um, yeah, I do that for all of them. But um, so yeah, just going back to the, the training side of things, this is probably the one thing that I just, I just don't think it can be underlooked enough. 
like the daily training, really. I mean, the the difference between someone who could be an okay salesperson, just letting them do their thing versus someone who can end up being great, I genuinely think is that daily training and then them being hungry to go outside of the training that the company provides to actually read their own books, do their own research, review their own sales schools. Like how often are they reviewing their sales schools? We review, I believe each week, I don't know exactly how many, but I think Vim is reviewing between three and five, like our sales manager reviews between like three to five sales schools per salesperson each week. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've been listening to the whole call. Whole call, takes notes, records his screen while he's doing it and goes through to actually give feedback. Because, again, you could think you've had a really, really killer call, but then if they didn't close, then, oh yeah, it's, it was a bad lead. Yeah. Of course, it's always a bad lead, right? Sales team are always going to say that. And sales team then w- will end up blaming marketing, and that creates a really toxic culture in the company. And so, like, we just want to avoid that toxic culture at all costs, you know? So, um, <laughs> that's why it's important to have an honest reporting system as well. Because without the honest reporting system, then... Yeah, it just ends up creating resentment within the business. And I've seen that happen before. I've seen it happen in my clients. We had it for a period of time too. And uh, thankfully now we just able to have really the difficult conversations, you know, if there's really not enough leads and the leads are all really low quality. Okay, take that to our head of marketing and actually, you know, let's create a solution together because otherwise one side's always going to blame the other. Talk to me about some of the actual tech and the little the little apps and integrations and stuff you use because I know you, you've mentioned uh, Loom and um, and obviously you talk about re- reviewing sales calls and these chatbots and stuff and I've um, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, dinosaur when it when it comes to te- <laughs> when it comes to tech anyway but just over the last couple of weeks I've actually just implemented Calendly Calendly oh there we th- go for the first time it's, it's quite funny because when I used to I used to get other people's ca- um, Calendly requests you know like uh, w- when you asked to speak to someone I'd get this calendar request through and I'd always look at it and think you're pretentious twat I'm not filling in a fucking calendar request yeah, you know yeah. to text me uh, then but then a couple of times lately there's been there's been people who let's say I very much respect and they've asked me to uh, to book in a calendar thing so I thought oh, let me have a look into this so I've, I've got my own cal- got my own calendar one now started using it and I swear by it now it's, it's just it's just so bloody efficient mm-hmm. isn't it you know mm-hmm. so you don't have to knock back and forth or can you do three o'clock or five o'clock on Friday no no I'm busy on Friday but I can do this and that on Monday and it's just there and it's bang and it's done so when I find an app I like, I, I, I do, uh, I, I do like to uh, promote it. But you've, you've obviously mentioned quite a lot of things that you guys do, uh, and I'm sure you know the, the, the tech is an integral part of, of of being able to manage this remote team. So, mm. so one of the things that actually interested me was how you do your social, how these guys use your social media, and how you then track it. Because if you've got multiple people logged into your account at one time, so how does how how do you know whose leads who, and how do you stop people, you know? Sending naughty pictures on your on, on your on your um, on your social because they I mean, could yeah they could I mean I thought it was you that sent me it whoops I know whoops <laughs> yeah they they have like all my uh, naughty pictures sent to all the right people <laughs> no but so Are you, but you're just trusting them with a the password there effectively no so we actually have a software which we've kind of custom edited for ourselves whereby all of our conversations from text where people are texting us um, from Instagram from Facebook from LinkedIn it all pulls into one place and so what then ends up happening is whoever's talking to them is just assigning it to themselves so that's one way the second way like we use this sort of more so like on the back end I'd say the majority of the conversation because when you're doing the outreach you obviously can't do it from there this is only when they've started replying to us however we find that yeah that tends to be best when someone has reached the point in the conversation where we count them as a worthy lead so then okay we hop over into this platform now and now we're going to start adding all the proper like labels to them making sure that we're assigning them the right place Um, a lot of it does happen automatically though But until that point, simple things that anyone can do is on the back end of your, well, I would say Facebook, but now it's meta, isn't it? So basically you can connect your Instagram profile to your Facebook page and so like your fan page on Facebook. And so then what you can do is you can navigate to an inbox. So if you just go on Google right now and type in, where is my Facebook pages inbox, then it will actually 
and I advise doing this on a desktop rather than on the phone because on the phone there's an app called Business Suite but it's just not as good you know I mean I don't know I don't like texting I prefer to type so anyways so then you go into your Facebook page on your desktop and then in the settings there you can actually add page roles and so then you can add multiple different page roles and if you set their page role as editor then they can only well the only thing that then my team would do is then message and so within the messenger you can add you can assign it to yourself but you can also add labels and so we used to have this whole labeling system honestly though again it's like at what point do I want my team to be focused on admin versus sales I would much rather they just spend their time doing sales so they this is why we then set up the back end software where everything pulls into one inbox so they don't need to focus on that so that then when they're messaging inside of the business manager on Facebook Insta they just message and then the back end is tracking it all for us so again that's a bit more complicated honestly you don't really need to do that unless you have like a sales team of more than I don't know I don't I wouldn't see any marginal gain until you have like eight people on your sales team really I wouldn't even think there's much point until that point just get them hammering and just getting those sales calls booked honestly um and so what, what do you use telephone wise so we can call through this software so we've integrated Twilio which is basically okay. a texting platform and you can do sales calls through that and it also automatically records all the calls so that will then record the call and then it will be stored under that contacts thing but you know some people request zoom calls now see we were doing zoom calls years ago before everyone had zoom and what would happen was people would say oh but I don't have this installed and so now it's quite a normal thing so we kind of you know we we give an option on our form when so let me just go back back a little bit so they're having the messaging conversation using the money making messaging method right and then they get to the point and they book the sales call they will then depending on the lead and depending how active they are either they'll send a link to book a call or they will simply just say so just do you happen to have some time available now i can get you in with my right hand and so then no sorry they'll say send me your best number your best you have to say best yeah. right send me your best number because if you have some time now I can get you in with my right hand and then boom they send that number and then like one it's, it's usually going to be someone from my team called Hannah or Ash will then give them a call and so if not that then they'll send them a link they it'll be like a Calendly link but we don't use Calendly it's like our own custom thing that we made and then there's just a few really simple questions like name email like what would you want help with um where's your revenue uh do you have a business partner yes or no and then like are they free to come on the call and this is we send the link if it's going to be someone who's being a bit more slow a bit more methodical if it's someone who's like oh my god lauren yeah like i've been looking for your heart for ages and they're like really fast then we'll just phone them straight away and so that's how we do that how yeah. do you deal with people expecting or wanting to speak to you given that all all this is outreach done in your name yeah. but ultimately you, you never speak to any of them you know what if what if someone's not because they're like a weird super fan but just you know but just because they they got an owner boner <laughs> yeah yeah i've not heard that before I like that. yeah because they've got an owner boner yeah. a lot of people get the owner boner but ultimately here's the thing I just don't want to set up false expectations when they actually come in as a client because I'm not the one that's going to be serving them. And so, yes, I am the one on the front end that's messaging them. And to be honest, sometimes I will, like, I do check my messages probably more than anything that I should be doing just because, like, it is constantly on my mind and it is probably the thing that I am the best at in everything that I do in my whole business. Like, if I was to get on my phone right now, I, within 10 minutes, I could probably book at least 10 sales calls. Like, I'm just so good at it. And so I do spend some time doing that. I am i don't know. For me, it's just a very simple thing. But <laughs> so with that said, and it's good because then if we're not hitting our targets, like, I'll just go in and I'll just, like, hammer it out. And I also have my head of ops who's also really sharp at it too because that's where she started in the business as well. And so, like, we'll just get on and we'll be like, right, let's sort this out and we'll go in in one day. Between us, we'll be book, like, 70 sales calls. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but with that said, so just going back to this, yeah, like, it's, it's all about setting the expectations, you know, because if... I am then like, oh, well, I I would get on the call with you, but I'm just busy. It's like, no, 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 I have an entire team who vets our enrollment process for me on my behalf because we're pretty selective about who yeah. we work with. 
And so we want to make sure that you're going to see results either way. They have different programs in which they can advise you with because they know all of our different clients because genuinely that's happened before where they've gotten a call with us. And then we've had someone come, I can think of a great example. Someone came in who wanted to get in, into property investing, okay? So wants to get on a call with me, right? And I'm obviously, I, I'm nothing to do with property myself. But you have a property course. No, 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 of course not. No, oh. no, 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 no. I would never build a program about something that I do not feel like I can confidently get people killer results on. But I have a client who has an amazing property program. We just help them build their and scale their course business, right? Like it doesn't really matter what the, the coaching program is. As long as it gets results, we can help them grow it. And so, yeah, they have a property course, property program. And so then we ended up connecting them and then they ended up becoming a client of this this company who's is her name's Cal, who owns the business. And so now this client's getting the results, like killer results. And so if we'd have tried to have said like, yeah, you know, we can help you with property. Like we just would never do that. I mean, we're, we're very black and white with who we work with um, just because otherwise it's, it's just painful for my team, you know? Um, but yeah, to your point, I mean, I think it just comes down to following the process, being methodical about the process, making sure that the team is trained on the process. We've tried it before where people will go, where we go in my messages like, oh, hi, it's um, Lauren's assistant here, or hi, it's one of Lauren's customer service reps. But people just don't reply back. And so the thing is, I mean, I think if my team are having an issue and they really want to speak to me, they'll, every day I get a briefing of like different things that are needed for me. And sometimes let's say we have a guy in the DMs called Jack and Jack's like, send me a photo so that I know that this is you. I'll go in there the next day and I'll be like, hi Jack, how are you doing? Haha, my team messaging you yesterday, but it's me now. And then I send it and then so be it. And then I'll just kind of keep an eye on what's going on there just to avoid any issues. But um, yeah, I mean- Only because Jack's hot, right? Oh yeah, yeah. only because Jack fit the SOP. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's kind of how we do it. Um, I think. A lot of people overthink it, honestly, but like at the end of the day, if this is going to bring in like exponential revenue for your business, then it makes sense to get it done properly. Tell me three mistakes that business owners make when recruiting or uh, building a sales team. The first mistake people make with a sales team is just hiring someone and thinking that it's going to solve all their problems. If you don't have a good offer, if you don't have a good product, if you don't have a good outcome that you're taking your clients to or a good deal or a good way of serving people, a salesperson is never going to solve that. A magic sales system isn't going to solve that. More leads isn't going to solve it. Ultimately, it's probably going to be more frustration because, <laughs> you know, when you bring more people onto your team, it's just added complexity. And so make sure that before bringing on a salesperson, you actually have a marketing message that converts because so many people build out these marketing assets like websites, funnels, social media content, driving people to opt in to a specific thing. But they build and waste all that time on building that thing before they know if people are ever even going to opt into it and convert on it. And so my perspective is you yourself get your first deals. Record every single step that you've taken with every single person that you've spoken with from the point of contact all the way through to the close or no close. Record the call and analyze that call. I like to turn everything into frameworks. There's a framework for everything. So there's a framework for getting the call booked. There's a framework even before that of finding the lead. Then once you've had the sales call, there's a framework on the call. And then you can look, okay, the ones that were successful versus the ones that weren't what ended up converting them. And if no one's converting, it's probably because your offer sucks. So I would say have at least 20 sales calls that you've been through this process with. Yeah, it might be a lot of effort, but it's gonna be worth it. So that's the first thing. Second thing I think, once you actually have a salesperson that you've hired is, well, <laughs> you could hire someone that's not hungry, okay? So you obviously really need to make sure that you hire someone that's hungry, that wants to make a lot of money, but probably even more importantly than that is align to your values. Because if they're aligned to your values and your company's values, then they're gonna enroll and sign the right clients at the right price point at the right time. Because again, the perfect client can come through the door, but if they only have 5,000 left and your offering is 5,000 and they're gonna be left with like no money, then even if you're pretty sure you can get them the results in like the first couple of weeks, it's kind of unethical to sell them at that point, right? So you could then make sure that your team 
have an ethical understanding to perhaps, okay, give them a payment plan that would work for them. Or take half of the money now and then half of the money once they got the result. Make it work with them. But again, that has to be in alignment with your values because if you're someone who just cares about money, right, then if you have someone who is a bit too much of a softie on the other hand, then you're gonna end up resenting them and getting frustrated. So it really comes down to that values alignment. And yeah, the third thing is just the, the daily training. Daily training is so important and so really just start the call or the start of the meeting testimonial just read out a client win make sure that everyone goes around the room and that if they they can share a quick client win that they've seen as well second thing is going into role plays from situations that they've had in the past 24 hours on their calls and then how to overcome those objections or situations that have popped up on that call and then on the back end of that just talking about a particular maybe concern that they have about how they can have a call that's you know they have a sales call coming up okay I've got this lead her name's Lucy in her application it says that she needs to speak to her partner but she's refusing to get her partner on the call what the hell do I do right and so then just overcome their problems so it's a really simple three-part process testimonial sections like two minutes then from there you can go into the role plays for 10 minutes and then on the back end another five minutes it doesn't need to be long do that every day and then they're going to become laser sharp but also as well, they need a bit of one-on-one. -on -one. I would say just making sure that if they're taking 20 sales calls a week, as an example, you're reviewing at least three of them so that you can hold them accountable. And if they aren't hitting their numbers, just don't keep them. Because if you actually allow people to stay in your company who aren't hitting the goals that you've set and the targets, then you're basically saying that we're a company that accepts mediocrity. And if you want to scale, then having that culture is not cool because believe it or not people talk to each other right and so if someone new comes in and they get on a call with the person that's been there for a while and the person that's new is like oh I'm really worried that I can't hit these numbers and the person that's been there for ages is like oh don't worry Lauren doesn't care about it you'll be fine then they're gonna slack from day one you don't want that so those are the three things that I would say and really it just comes down to honestly I, I just can't say this enough like people could really sell so much more if they had something that actually works <laughs> really no I, I, yeah i mean when you were saying that at the beginning uh about uh, you know ha having a, you know a product and having having done it yourself i think you know so often especially with a lot of the uh, let's say legacy businesses or you know older businesses you know that that that, that is a big problem that you know that, that these guys think that um you know just because you know the world's changed you know they need different kind of sales people you know to, to be able to sell the product or you know mm. different marketing different marketing messages but ultimately you know the the the, the products are fundamentally 10 years out of date 15 20, 20 years out of date and like you say if, if you can't get the product right and you can't sell it yourself then how the, how the hell is anyone else going to sell it and i've i've always said that you know any business i've been involved in i i would want to buy that product mm -hmm. i would genuinely yeah. want to buy the product but, you know okay i might not be the uh it might not be something that i would typically buy my day-to-day -day. like i don't know it, let, let's say it was a you know a, a, i don't know a, 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 a you know discount kitchenware or something you yeah. know maybe i'm not going out there buying discount kitchenware but if i was to be buying discount kitchenware i would want to be able to buy that particular mm -hmm. product you know mm -hmm. I, i'd want it to to work or whatever I, I'd want to be able to proudly represent it totally. with, with, with the people and you know um I think you know, the, the the word you know ethical selling and stuff gets 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 used uh, used a lot nowadays and you mm -hmm. know uh, I mean, for me whilst I'm not you know normally into the kind of you know uh, airy fairy new world new world uh, phrases uh, I do very much believe that if you don't want to buy your own product you're in the wrong fucking business. Oh, a hundred percent. That's it, isn't it? Because how can you have conviction? Because conviction equals sales. If you can truly believe that if someone doesn't buy your thing, they are gonna be worse off, then you're gonna do whatever it takes to paint the picture as to how their life is gonna look with and without your product or service. And you can do that with so much heart and soul. I remember one of my first like high ticket clients that I ever had, she she has a, she's, she helps people lose weight on a vegan diet, right? And so, you know what vegans can be like. Or... Oh, I do. I know what vegans can be like. Look, I was also ve <laughs> I was vegan for two years, so I can say that, by the way. But, like, it gets religious, right, for mm -hmm. some people. And so she is so passionate about what she sells. She was a teacher 
for her whole life. And then she got into her coaching and she was like so afraid of sales. And I was like, just get on a call with them and tell them how their life is gonna be with you or without you. And I'm telling you, I've never seen someone close so many deals in my life. She would literally close nine out of 10 every calls that she would be taking just cause she was so obsessed with what she was selling. And it was a high ticket offer as well. And so I just couldn't, I, I still can't believe that she was selling her vegan weight loss for such a high price. But anyways, I digress. But finally, alongside of conviction, frameworks 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 for everything because when you have frameworks it then becomes repeatable and it becomes beyond just you because of course if you're the business owner you can be a little bit cheeky you know you can kind of say a few things or work a little bit of a deal that someone else on your team might not be able to but having flexible frameworks such as the one i walked you through earlier with the messaging checklist literally having the same thing on a sales call and having it out in front of you while you're on that call while you're in that meeting literally i ha- i will have a checklist of like the multiple different things that i need to go through like what is their pain what is their goal um what is their just are they are they actually the decision maker because sometimes people will say it on the front end yeah. that they are and they actually aren't um how soon do they want to get started? Like I will literally go through these things and tick them off as I go. And if they're like, and by the way, you don't have to ask the question like that. You don't have to just say, oh, how soon are you looking to get started? You can have like a setup question like, oh wow. So it sounds like this is pretty important to you, huh? I mean, how long have you been trying to lose weight? And then they'll say, blah, blah, blah. It's like, interesting. And so what do you feel like is going to happen if you, if you don't get started on this soon? And then they're going to start saying, saying, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Like, oh, wow. Yeah, no, I really need to do this now. Okay. So, so are you looking to get started now or or when would that be? And then, then they'll say it. Right. And so it's like, you don't have to just say it as it is. You have to do the setup questions and then you can go in with the actual outcome that you need to get. And so I just kind of see it like connecting the dots or like kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. And then you can make a game out of it and then it becomes fun every time you do it. That's what I think whenever I'm doing the DMing conversations. For me, it's just a, how can I, how can I swerve this where I want it to go, right? So, so I don't know, maybe I'm just weird, but, but like that's how I see it anyways. And so then when I kind of train it to my team like it's a game, then they have fun while they're doing it. And then they'll literally be like lying in bed trying to, it's probably a bit unhealthy, but, but like they'll be lying in bed trying to get their last sales call closed. Or, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just sat there now wondering which one of your sales team it is that replies when I'm, when I'm, when I'm, text, when I'm texting you. <laughs> no, no, they don't have WhatsApp. That's fine. You're good. Not yet anyways, but I heard Facebook's trying to integrate them all together. <laughs> Well, listen, Lauren, it's been great having you here. Yeah, that was uh, fun. Love talking. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've not had many you know, friends on the podcast before. I mean, I don't know, probably three or four times, but I always, I always find it a much more relaxed dynamic as well. And, and yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's a bit more fun. Uh, but to be able to do that and talk about, uh, you know, talk about great stuff is fantastic. So well, thanks a lot good. for being here. Just before you go, obviously, I'm sure everyone else wants to, you know, wants to be able to track you down and ask you questions and ho- hopefully buy some courses off you too. So where can we find you? How can we contact you? Yeah, so in Instagram at Lauren Tickner, L-A-U-R-E-N-T-I-C-K-N-E-R. And then we do weekly lives. I do them in my Facebook group. So it's called Impact School Frameworks to Grow Coaching Courses Cash Flow. So it's just, if you type Impact School into Facebook, you'll find it. And you, don't, you don't have to be a customer. You, you, no, no, it's free. Yeah, we do. Like, honestly, it's one of my favorite um, things because we've got a really nice community in there. I feel like that's one of the things that was lacking in in sort of the space that I'm in is community because there's so many coaches and people who want to have courses and stuff going at it by themselves, watching YouTube videos and everything. So I wanted to just bring everyone together because my aim now is like, I am pretty much giving away all of our content for free. Like we're no longer going to be charging for pretty much all of our courses and then we're just going to have our high level coaching programs. And uh, yeah, that's the aim just to give everything give everything to the people so that then they have the framework so that they can actually get the results. So I just want to genuinely make change in the coaching space so that good people can do good things. So 
Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm hoping to hear that you're going to be a Forbes Online Coach of the Year 2022 <laughs> and 2023 as well. Lauren, oh, thanks, yes. a, thanks a lot again. Guys, mm. thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed listening or watching to Lauren as much as I've enjoyed talking to her. As always, if you're watching this, you can get the audio version on iTunes, on Spotify, or on wherever you get your podcasts. If you're listening to the audio version, you have to watch it with my pretty face on YouTube as well. You can get me on all of my socials at the Matt Haycox. That's T-H-E-M-A-T-T-H-A-Y-C-O-X. And I look forward to seeing you again in a future episode with another great guest. Bye.